Hello, everyone. Uh, a very, very warm welcome. Thank you for joining uh, us at Bytree uh, Asset Management this evening, uh, where we are doing a webinar entitled Profit from Inflation uh, with Bitcoin and Gold in 2021. And uh, to run us through a presentation is uh, our Chief Investment Officer, Charlie Morris, uh, who will be well known to all of you as uh, <coughs> Uh, a, a long-term and highly successful multi-asset fund manager and, of course, editor uh, of the Fleet Street Newsletter and Atlas Pulse. Um, and with him today, uh, particularly delighted to, to have Ross Norman. Uh, Ross is an old friend of ours and uh, an extremely well-known uh, name in the gold market. He founded and was CEO of Sharps Pixley uh, and, of course, is the CEO of Metals daily.com. Um, you're seeing this on YouTube. So uh, what we're going to try and do is have about 35 minutes of, of, of Charlie and Ross uh, chatting. Uh, and then we will try and take as many questions uh, as possible and rattle on into the night uh, with, 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 with all that. Uh, and to, to ask a question, there should be a panel uh, on the side of your YouTube. So just tap in a question. Uh, and we'll pull that all together later. And with that, any further ado, I shall hand over to Charlie and Ross. Thank you, Charlie. So we'll, we'll, we'll get cracking. I think the background to, to this um, and, and the sort of call to action is that the gold market's been, been pretty soft the last six months. But let's not forget the fact that um, the first half of last year was pr pretty strong and all the rage uh, was gold and everything gold related and silver and gold miners. Um, last summer, whilst Bitcoin was was flat at 10k, something changed in October, um, and gold basically handed the baton to Bitcoin um, in this reflationary world. And you know, a lot of people are saying that Bitcoin uh, is the new gold, and you know, fair, fair enough, they'd think that, but but we don't think that is true. We think that they're both fantastic assets um, in, a, in an inflationary environment. A uh, little bit of bit of a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the fire exits are on your left. And um, if you need a drink, then press the button and uh, a hostess will come immediately. There's also a legal disclaimer here. So uh, please read that very carefully. Um, this is, this is a, a, a sort of money map that I've been um, um, following for, for, for many, many years. And um, essentially, you can populate the boxes in many different ways. Uh, but in simplest terms, you've got on the left hand side, the risk off assets which are gold and bonds. And on the right-hand side, you've got the risk on assets. So that's basically the, the assets that are doing well when the economy is doing well. And they would be hard assets in the inflationary environment and, and the stock market um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of Goldilocks scenario when inflation is low. Put it another way, we can look at the bottom of the money map and we can see bonds and equities, the typical 60-40 portfolio, which has done extremely well since 1982. And during the good times, the equities roared. During the bad times, uh, the, the, the bonds held up very well and made some money at that time. And then the assets that um, haven't done so well really over the last um, over 40 years, um, not so only the last, the last 10 or 20, depending on what we look at, uh, as inflation, inflation sensitive assets really haven't had the best time in the last 20. Obviously, Bitcoin is a bit of an exception. It's done extraordinarily well, but hard assets in general haven't. And gold, although it did very, very well from 2000 to 2011, really has been uh, pretty flat since then. And of course, from 1980 to 2000, gold did pretty badly, essentially because we've been in a deflationary world. And I suppose the big call post-COVID is we're going into an inflationary world. And that is that the above the line assets will do extremely well um, going forward. And the below the line assets, bonds and equities, uh, maybe have given us too much already and have little, little more to give in the future. So to the right, we have risk on. To the left, we have risk on. On the top, we have inflation. On the bottom, we have deflation. And that is that is really the basis of this conversation today. Now, Roth, there's something you want to add to this slide. So please crack on. Yeah, um, it's, it's really the assets above the line and, and the inflation story. Uh, I was intrigued to see that BlackRock recently released a report to suggest that uh, gold was not a good hedge in inflationary times. Um, I'm not sure what they're reading. We don't have an inflationary times just yet. Currently, UK inflation is below 1% and US inflation is at 1.7%. There seems to be something of a disconnect going on in the markets between the narrative and the data. Gold seems to be following the data. And the data at the moment is very, very, should we say, muted in terms of inflation expectations. But the narrative is very different. And I've got some numbers here, Charlie, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to share with you in terms of some of the cost push inflation 
that we could see coming through. And I've chosen a random list of about 40 um, commodities that you'll be pleased to hear here. I won't go through all of them, but just a, a number of them. And it gives you a flavor of what's been happening in the commodity sector since pre-COVID, so since January last year. Assets like sugar, up 23%, cotton, 23%, iron, 87%, rubber, 40%, ethanol, 29%, um, the um, lean hogs, 36%, um, copper and coal, both 45%, lumber, 137%. You get the picture um, that most assets are up a, a significant double digit figure. The only asset I could find which has actually fallen was live cattle and milk. Um, but um, you could add to that, of course, it's not just the raw assets themselves, it's also the cost of shipping. The Global Container Index, it's January last year, um, is up a massive 184%. And indeed, semiconductors, after the car industry, up 44%. Now, in your normal white goods that you might buy, the raw, the raw assets are about a third of the total cost. In your food basket, in the shopping, uh, in the supermarket, roughly two thirds. So this isn't the full story. And there's no question that this, what's holding inflation back at the moment is the velocity of money. And in a reflationary environment that we'll be going into in the second half of this year, we will see a, pick, a quickening of the pace of inflation, I expect. And therefore, by extension, the assets are above your line there, both Bitcoin, hard assets and gold will all perform very strongly. I think, the, I think that the um, Bank of England in particular is missing uh, the story here. They're, expectation, they're expecting inflation to be in the 2 to 4% bracket um, in, the, in the second half of this year. I would expect a figure close to 6 to 7%, um, uh, a figure that we saw um, at the end of last century. Well, thanks, Ross. I, mean, I just got a couple of replies out on Twitter today. I put out my BT phone bill, which is CPI plus 3.9% this year. Um, someone's written in saying that their um, council tax is up 10%. And so, you know... Um, much bigger numbers than we're hearing so so yeah inflation inflation is on the horizon um but of course you know asset inflation and, and consumer inflation are slightly different but let's not go into that right now um i want to tell a sort of bit of a story of the history of uh, of, of bitcoin from a macro perspective and that is that you know it kind of started off as a tech stock um, and what i mean by that is it came from the internet and it's a network effect situation and it's no great surprise to me that it's been following the returns at, or, the, or the path of social media stocks um, over the last decade. And this is the illustration. Obviously, Bitcoin has outperformed massively. Bitcoin in the, in the, in the last decade went up from zero dollars to uh, one trillion dollars. Social media stocks went from zero dollars to a trillion dollars in the decade before that. But in the last decade, went from one trillion to five trillion dollars. But notice how the year by year. So, yes, while Bitcoin has outperformed massively, it came to the market at a very low price. But the big years in 2013 and 2017 and 2020 match for both for both asset classes and the bad years 2014 and 18 also match. And I think, you've, you know, while you don't see day to day correlation, you do see um, this big picture shift in prices and the sort of, you know, whether when the Internet related assets are in fa favour or not. And social media is, a, is, is the stock market group that I would think is most similar to, similar to Bitcoin. But the chart tells the story of how that has decoupled in the last few months. And this is the interesting bit. And so I've been telling this story about the link between Bitcoin and social media for the last few uh, years. And uh, I really I think it's, you know, evidence is suggesting that that is changing. And so if you go back to the last slide very briefly, you know, Bitcoin started as an equity um, or a tech stock in the red box, and it's graduated to the hard asset box. And I suppose if you think it's going to become the next goal, then maybe in 30 or 50 or 5,000 years, it could get into the top left box and take gold's place. But it ain't happening in 2021. But I think there's a huge there's a huge story here uh, that, that Bitcoin is growing up. And that's certainly what the evidence is that we see. Um, to go back to the money map and to, to talk about what's happened to rates and inflation over the last 20 years, um, the 10-year, the US 10-year Treasury yield is shown in black. The inflation rate, 
Um, that's the 10 year expectation is in red. And notice how it started the period of 2% and it's still roughly 2%. So it's actually been remarkably stable. And every time it's fallen, um, the central banks have become very worried and that's really what's triggered stimulus. And the green line is the real interest rate, which is the difference between the black and the red line. So the real interest rate was plus four in 2000 when gold was $250 and uh, Bitcoin hadn't been thought of. I mean, it, the, 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 the seed of the idea was there, but it was a long way from, from, from being ready. And as the real interest rate went from four all the way down to, uh, to negative in 2011, 12, um, that was a very, very good time for the gold market. And the gold market did nothing in the intervening years pretty much um, until recently, um, that when it, you know, to 2018 to, to mid last year, where it responded well to the fall in real yield. And it's been under a little, little, under, been under a little bit of pressure as that, as that um, um, yield has been rising again. Now, Ross, did you want to come in? Yeah, I did actually. I mean, it's interesting looking at the correlation coefficient between gold and and treasury sort of tips. Um, back in 2017, it was quite light at about minus 0.32, so inversely related. Um, but it was not until 2019, 2018 and 2019, where the correlation really tightened up at minus 0.91 or 91 percent inverse correlation coefficient. And in 2020, it was up at 95 percent. This year, the relationship holds, but a little less, a little more loosely at 87%, roughly the same as the US dollar index. So both inversely correlated to both the dollar and also the, the, the 10 year tips. Uh, and no question that the uh, 10 year yields going to negative in 2018 was the beginning, uh, sorry, in 2019 was the beginning of a, of a significant bull run. And we, we see notwithstanding the, the recent correction that that will be maintained. Yeah, thanks. I would say on that, I mean, my, my view about when people say, you know, gold's just the inverse of the dollar. Well, that's true when the green line is going sideways. When the green line is decisively going up or down, it sure ain't. The dollar doesn't come into the picture. Um, but when it's basically when real interest rates are flat, then gold has no other thing to hang off apart from being the opposite of the dollar. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you, computer, for not changing slide. Let's kick that. There we go. I'll use the mouse pad. So just to give a bit of historic um, um, color on the relationship between the rate and change of the inflation expectations and the rate of change of the Bitcoin price. Now, I've, I've, got, a, I've got a sort of um, a two year rolling year on year um, inflation expectation shown in, in, in the red bars. Now they're 100% they're true. Now I've had to fudge the Bitcoin price a bit, I will admit that, because Bitcoin's had such big moves so it just goes off the scale. So I've had to shrink it slightly. And um, so, so you probably won't be able to re recreate this chart, but do get in touch if you, I really haven't cheated, I've just made the chart look nice. And, and, and the bottom line is that when, when the inflation expectation was going down in 14 and flat in 15, you know, Bitcoin didn't do very much and the bull market really kicked off uh, with, with the expectation, you know, the rate of change um, going up in 16, 17, and then came down again in 18, 19, and it's gone roaring as it's gone up. So, you know, it's a, it's a sort of very simple idea that actually the, um, uh, the price of Bitcoin is quite, quite sensitive to the rate of inflation. And, and the same is true for bond yields, perhaps slightly less so, probably more recently than before. But again, we see that idea that in 1415, um, the, the bond yield sort of was, was, was coming down. Not a great environment for Bitcoin. 1617, much better. Um, sometimes markets identify things early. Sometimes prices get ahead of events. And so perhaps the uh, bull market in 17 might have gone on for a little longer from a macro perspective, but certainly the price of Bitcoin had run out of steam. Then we had a, a weak period in, um, in 18 and 19 before settling down in 20 to the roaring performance we're seeing today. So a little bit of evidence of the, of, of the sort of um, top right nature of Bitcoin's macro behavior as seen by the money map. It likes a rising bond yield and it likes rising inflation. Now to move to gold, which is a very, very different story um, entirely, the, the price of gold, in my opinion, follows the model I created. That's not um, a great surprise. By the way, this uh, model is available on the Bytree Asset Management website, updated every day. And it's a pretty simple concept. It's basically that um, you know, the, the, the price of gold is reflected by the, his, the historic debasement of money. So that's 90% over the last half century or so. Um, the, the, the real interest rate, which is a popular idea, I use 20-year 
uh, bond yields because they have a, a correlation match. And then looking into the future expectations. So we're you know, currently on, on the cusp of waiting for, uh, um, for, for the long-term inflation expectations to really pick up, um, which hasn't happened for a very long time, as we saw a couple of slides ago. But you know, what is gold doing? Is, has gold been replaced by Bitcoin? No, it's just gone back from a little bit of a hype in um, the summer last year, um, back to bang on fair value within a few dollars. And this, this chart literally is a day old. So it's, um, you know, that there is, if, if, if Bitcoin, sorry, if gold was collapsing uh, below the fair value to some big discount to fair value, then you might think actually something's changed, but it's just behaving normally um, as, as, you, as you'd expect. And if the real interest rate starts falling again and the inflation picks up, then Bitcoin will start, I'm uh, sorry, I get confused. Gold will start rising again. So sometimes it goes to a premium like it did in 2011. Gold gets ahead of itself, just like it did last summer, and then goes back to fair value. Now, Ross, would you like to compliment my uh, gold model that's worked so well over the years? <laughs> well, it gives a very good, it's an elegant, isn't it? I don't know what the correlation is, is in there between your model and the gold price. It looks very tight. Certainly. 86 R squared over uh, quite a long time. I was going to say north of 90. Great. I mean, uh, one looks at, you know, bond yields, etc., to understand the gold market. Stepping aside from that, um, the market, interesting enough, at the moment does feel it's, it's in a unique space. We've seen some epic changes in the last year. It's probably worth touching on very briefly. Um, typically, gold is an Asian-centric market. Um, it's very price sensitive. Um, last year, we saw some epic changes, not least of all with COVID, and the market reversed to becoming a Western-centric market. Um, flows reverse, that is to say. And um, of course, um, with that kind of environment, we saw epic changes in, in acquisition of ETFs. And I think we touch on that a, in a little bit later on. It does feel though that the market's reverted to type in 2021. It's going, the flows are going back into Asia at long last. Um, the ETF volumes have fallen off and we're back to sort of the more normal markets. Um, but anyway, going back to your model, Charlie, it's, it's a great rear view mirror. It's elegant, but what does it tell us about the future? I think that comes up in the next chart, doesn't it? So rude, Ross. Here are the scenarios that we can um, that we can look at in the future. Not the rearview mirror, but the um, but the binoculars into 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 the um, the twenty first century. And and so I'll just describe this briefly. Imagine the the last model. You know what could could change the scenarios. Now I put some extreme scenarios in here. Along the top, we've got zero 20 year bond yields. And on the right hand side, on the left hand side is zero. Um, and that would be very good for gold. And then I've got 10 percent bond yield, which would be uh, bad for gold. And then we've got the on the y axis, we've got the inflation expectations. Uh, high inflation is good for gold, so that's 10% at the top and 0% on the bottom. So the worst possible scenario for gold would be a 10% bond yield and a and no inflation at all. That takes us to the bottom right at $156 an ounce. The best possible scenario um, is 10% is a, a inflation and, um, and, and a zero bond yield, so that would be pretty spectacular central banking if we saw that. $58,000 an ounce. And, um, and I think the other important point is the diagonal line from the bottom left to the top right. That basically is your constant real interest rate. So on the bottom left, you've got $1,000 gold with zero, zero. But on the top right with 10, 10, you've got 7,000. So I've always made this argument that inflation matters more than the bond yield. And going back to the chart I showed earlier, that over the last 20 years, inflation expectations have basically been flat for 20 years. So it's all about the bond yield. Now, Ross, over to you. Come on, give us some scenarios. Well, I think, Charlie, you, you asked me before this presentation, where, where do we see gold in 10 years? What's, what's, the, what's the likely scenario? To answer that, you need to paint a picture of what it could look like, the world could look like over that period of time. If you think that today we stand in 1973, oil shock, uh, first oil shock, before the second oil shock in the 1980s, I'd say probably no, um, because gold was constrained leading up to 1973, and there, there was an element of catch-up plus the oil shock disintermediating the two factors is quite difficult. But if it, if it was similar to that, hang on to your hat, score would be onto a 30% compound annual growth rate over the next seven years. Almost enough to make a Bitcoin a blush. Um, but I don't think we're quite in that scenario. Perhaps on the other hand, um, if we looked at that high inflationary period, but not as bad as that, we use annual averages to bring the numbers down a little bit and take it to 1983, involving the second oil shock. Well, during that period of time, gold saw a 16% annual compound annual growth rate over that period of time. That would suggest if you thought that we were in 1973 and looking at 83 uh, and using annual averages, not the high that we saw at 850 in, in, in 1980, but the annual averages, then that would suggest that in 10 years time, gold would be about $7,500 an ounce. 
Uh, come back to that number, Charlie, because I know you did a report suggesting that gold would get to $7,000 in, in a few years' time. But hear me through, hear me through. Um, on the other hand, perhaps you think that gold, we're sitting in 2000, which wasn't a period of great inflation, but it's a period of time where there was some inflation and gold was on a bull run of its own making. Gold tends not to do stupid percent in increases. It's got legacy issues attached to it. It's got a huge amount of production going back 3,000 years. And if the market runs ahead of itself, scrap comes back to the market and the price sensitive parts of the market decline. So it tends to do something in the double digits. Um, if you felt that we're at the beginning of 2000 and we're looking at 2000 to 2010, then that would suggest that you're looking at a 16% increase in the gold price year on year. Two years ago, we saw 19%. Last year, we saw 25%. This year, I'm confident we'll see a double digit gain, uh, but perhaps a little less than the, the previous two years. So it does feel like we're moving into an inflationary period. Now, just to conclude from my side, Charlie, Credit Suisse did some report, a report on gold in, in various inflationary scenarios. And when gold gets, when inflation gets above 3%, then gold starts to follow the data on inflation, not yields and not other things, not the dollar. It fixates on the CPI figures. And that's where you get the big double digit gains in the, in the, in the gold price. Gold doesn't work in a uniform step, binary step with inflation until it's a significant number. And they would estimate that to be 3%. And then you'll start to see the market literally following lockstep with inflation figures from three to three and a half and higher. We're not there yet, but I think we will be in the second half of this year. Well, that's quite interesting. Um, number three percent, because Russell Napier would tell you that every equity bull market uh, basically runs out of steam when CPI hits four percent. So you can see that three to four zone probably starts to get interesting when gold starts to go bananas and equities really start to run out of steam. So, you know, why, you know, Bitcoin versus gold? Um, what we've got here is the grey line is, is, um, is the price of Bitcoin measured in gold ounces. Um, that's on the left hand side. It's 35 at the moment or so. And, and on the right hand scale, we've got the, the 10 year bond yield again. And it's a very simple argument that, that when, the, when the bond yield's been going up, Bitcoin's been outperforming gold. And when the bond yield's been going down, gold has been outperforming Bitcoin. This is not rocket science, ladies and gentlemen, by any means. And, uh, and this is why I just believe strongly that the combination of Bitcoin and gold in a inflationary environment is a very, very powerful one. Because, of the, you, know, we, you know, it's all well and good to say our time, my portfolio. And, uh, and, and you know, I try to do that as a professional investor in the fleet street letter and so forth, sometimes with success, other times with less success. But the bottom line is to build a balanced portfolio that, that can withstand more scenarios is a very powerful concept. And so if you want to hedge against inflation, then Bitcoin and gold together uh, work in harmony. Obviously, gold is very stable. It's got low volatility. Bitcoin's very volatile and very racy. And so you don't need as much Bitcoin as you do need gold uh, to balance that portfolio. So that, that's really the, the, the simple concept that we have identified at Bytree Asset Management. Now, we can't talk about, um, about, about products because we, we're, we're not allowed to by, by, by law. So, but please do look at our website and, and sign up and we can explain these things in more detail if you're interested. Now, back, back to Bitcoin. So we, you know, we've sort of um, talked about the year from the perspective of the bond market and from yields and from inflation expectations. Now, let's what, what have the investors done with their money? And um, in, in this exercise, I've added up all the uh, Bitcoins purchased by the funds. Some of them are in Europe, in Sweden, in Switzerland um, and in Germany. And, and there are an increasing number of funds coming through in America and Canada, um, um, in, in, you know, to, to, to complement Grayscale, which has been the monster in the room for quite a long time. And in the fourth epoch of Bitcoin, which basically means since the last halving period, which was the 12th of May last year, um, the black line shows you how many Bitcoins uh, not just have been, been mined, but, but have actually been released into the network by miners. So there's that little jump in December, which was one of the miners who, who, who unleashed some inventory into the market. So not quite as smooth as the, um, as, as, as the sort of uh, as a generation line. Now, the blue line shows you the a number of Bitcoins that are held by Bitcoin funds. And, you know, they've bought more Bitcoin than have been mined in the market and released into the market. So, you know, it really tells you a lot about the last um, uh, year. And the interesting point here is when did the mine, you know, the, when, when did the buyers of the Bitcoin funds overtake the mine supply? Um, about October, which was about the same time 
that the, 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 the bond yield started to go up. So another way to see it. And um, I think I just wanna you know, touch on this whole idea of, uh, of the supply side of Bitcoin. And so the epochs are the four year periods between halving events um, Epoch one was 2012. So obviously Bitcoin came to market in, in came to be in 2009. So 2009, 2012, and then 2016, and then 2020. And we're now in the fourth epoch. So there are 21 million Bitcoins um, in the future. And in the first epoch by 2012, 10 and a half million have been mined, half that each time. So epoch two, another 5 million, another 2 million. And this time we'll have 1.3, uh, 125 million Bitcoins uh, mine. So far, we've seen, as at two days ago, uh, 277,000 Bitcoins mined, which is 21% of the total for the current epoch. Too many numbers, I know, but it sort of gets the point across. Now, look at the fourth row, percent of the 21 million. So by 2012, half the Bitcoins have been mined, then three quarters, then 88% by May last year, now 89. And this goes to about 95 um, in three years' time. So the vast majority of Bitcoins that will ever exist already exist. And, and the, the run rate for inflation is now below 2% as a result of that. Now we can look at the numbers released into the, into the network. And as I showed you um, the, on, the, on the fourth epoch, Bitcoin released into the network 306,000 Bitcoin. That was on the last slide in the, in the um, you know, supply by the miners. Um, in the good old days, that was a lot more coins. That was 8.4 million, 5.4 million, 2.9 million. So these things are getting scarcer. Um, and the result of the, you know, what they've actually released into the network is the inventory. And so, the, so you know, what's, what's left out there. And so we, we had 10 and a half million Bitcoins mined in the first epoch, 8.4 million were released into the network, leaving 2 million coins in inventory. And that inventory has been, been going down in epochs two, three, and four. The funds have come in, nothing in epoch one because they didn't exist. Epoch two, they took up 182,000 Bitcoin, then 220 in epoch three, and then recently 380. So at much higher prices, the funds have become more interested in accumulating Bitcoin than they were in the past. And so put all that together, implied non-fund demand, um, basically the entire market was propped up by the retail investor in the past. And now that's gone to deficit because the institutions have come in and bought more Bitcoin than there are available. And that is why we've seen such a, a strong market in recent, in, um, um, in recent months. Yeah, the macro, which has encouraged the institutional investor to look for an effective inflation hedge in a risk on inflationary environment. And there they are. So um, on the flows, the, the gold line is the amount of money that's gone into or out of the uh, Bitcoin ETFs and uh, in billion dollars on the left axis. Or, or, or million dollars, so 20,000 means 20 billion. And then the black line is the uh, flows into the Bitcoin funds and they've nearly met. Um, but you know, you can't really say that the 25 billion goes into the, into the gold funds by October, gold ETFs by October, and they go straight to Bitcoin. Because actually I think most of it probably went to equities, but some of it would have gone to, uh, to Bitcoin. And I just show that the tipping point in October when the Bitcoin inflows accelerated and the gold outflows, um, started to move again, coincides with that rising bond yield. So Ross, what's your thoughts there? Yeah, it's interesting looking at that uh, gold line, which is the gold ETF um, um, redemptions or uptake and redemptions. Um, last year was an exceptional year. In, in the first quarter of um, 2020, we saw 300 tons going into gold ETFs, followed in the second quarter by a further 436 tons. Now, those first two quarters were better than any previous full year in total. So it was an exceptional year. Um, but in the third quarter of last year, it was quite clear that things were on the wane with 271 tonnes taken up. And in the fourth quarter, there were redemptions of 130 tonnes. So the market was in retreat. This quarter, this first quarter this year, we expect it to, to have redemptions of about 200 tonnes. So that's a swing, if you like, of plus 400 tonnes to minus 200 tonnes. A 600 tonne on a market which produces, what, three and a half thousand tonnes is a big number. Um, in, in value terms, um, year to date, about 17 billion has moved out of gold, um, has been sold in, in, in the ETF sector. And reading your black line there, it looks like about five billion, five billion in total has got into, into Bitcoin. So, yeah, a, a certain part of it, whether it's a swap one for the other, who knows? Um, anecdotally, you know, the, the Bitcoin market is far smaller than the gold market. Um, it's less liquid, arguably, as well. Um, but certainly, we've seen a crossing over 
of, of, of the uptake in the Bitcoin world and a, as we've seen a decline in the ETF world, unquestionably. And I think that chart shows that very clearly. I think the, you know, we, can we can really make a bit of an ad for Bitcoin and gold in different ways here. You, know, you put a small amount of, bit, of money into Bitcoin. I think, I think the number is about 8 billion, just under 8 billion, uh, Ross, over the last 10 months. And you know, that takes Bitcoin from 10 bucks, 10,000 bucks to 60,000 bucks. Uh, and you know, gold goes from, uh, you, take, you take $15 billion out of gold and it goes from uh, 2,000 to 1,700, you know. So it, it's, it's, it's not a very big fall for gold, is it really? given how much money has come out of it. Now, if you took that much money out of Bitcoin, that'd be pretty, you know, the market would be pretty bloody unhappy about it. Um, and in the same way, you know, if you put that sort of money into Bitcoin, it would carry on roaring, although it'd be harder to make it roar at 60,000 than at 10,000. And so some of these arguments are incredibly obvious, but, you know, gold is a huge, big, deep, deep, uh, deep um, liquid market, which, which really um, doesn't respond nearly as much as it, uh, to flows as something like Bitcoin would. And that's something that people should probably consider. Oops. Um, putting them together, there's Bitcoin to, to the end of January 21 from the beginning of 14 um, in grey uh, and gold's in gold, barely moves on a log scale, uh, but it's done, done okay. The table shows you it's made you um, a little bit of money, 6% a year in, a, in an environment that wasn't particularly friendly to gold. Uh, Bitcoin did 70% a year, fantastic. Um, but put them together, if you, if you risk weight these two assets together, you have gold characteristics on the risk side in terms of drawdown, so that bottom row on the table, max drawdown, um, you know, 20% for gold, 21% for, for, for um, bold, which is the combination. And, and you have you know, very attractive returns, sort of tech stock type returns with gold-like volatility and, and, um, and low drawdowns. And we just think that as the market swings from risk on to risk off over the next 10 years, this concept of holding and rebalancing gold and Bitcoin between one another uh, will really, really work well in portfolios. Now, obviously, if you have a strong view that Bitcoin is the one this moment in time, then own Bitcoin is going to go up way higher. But let's not forget what I was saying earlier. You know, over the last 10 years, Bitcoin's gone from zero dollars to a trillion dollars, like the tech stocks did, like every big company, every successful group of investments did um, in their startup era. And then when the social media stocks you know, went from one trillion to five trillion, they did so more slowly or more pedestrian like manner. Still very exciting, still very profitable over the decade. And you can't expect anything like the behavior we've seen in the last decade from Bitcoin as we will go into the future. So, um, you know, I do think that in the risk on times, it will do extremely well. Um, and in the risk off times, and I think there will be downside. And the blend really is the powerful balance between the two. Um, Ross, did you want? Sorry, did you want to come in on the last one? Yeah, I did actually. Um, I think the concept of adding two assets like Bitcoin and gold is a, is, is an interesting one. Rewind the clock to two thousand again, if you will. Um, back then, and I'm going to go off piece here a bit, Charlie. Forgive me. Um, back in two thousand, in the auto sector, they launched a car called the Crossover, which was neither the saloon car nor the SUV. It was a bit of both. And purists thought, well, it, it's it's going to fall between two stools. It's neither as good as the one or the other. Um, I can tell you that today, 20 years on, the crossover sector is the biggest in the car sector. It accounts for 42% of cars. The reality is that combining of these two asset classes, if you like, actually takes from the best of both worlds. It takes from gold's, um, the backstory attached to gold, the store of value, the stability of gold, um, et cetera. And it adds to that the performance, the high, the high octane performance of Bitcoin. My belief is actually combining the two, you will see the best of both asset classes. They can learn from each other. Quite often in the media, you see them pitted against each other antagonistically. I think that's the wrong attitude. I think actually they're very complementary and combining the two is quite a powerful outcome. Yeah, well, we're, we're big fans of this whole concept of rebalancing. You know, if you take two um, assets that are interesting, obviously they've both got to do well over the long term um, or, or, or even you know, slightly well over the long term, they'd have to be fantastic. But provided they're fundamentally different, um, but neither goes to zero, then the concept of rebalancing transactions adds value. Now, I mean, the, the, the bottom line here is that if Bitcoin and, and gold went sideways for the next five years, unlikely scenario, but if they did, then the rebalancing between them, because they do it at different times, would actually end up generating profits. You know? And if one did very badly and one did well, you get the average. Um, if one does extraordinarily well, then, then obviously you underperform the best one. But in most scenarios, the concept of rebalancing um, adds value over the long term. Not in the short term, obviously, but um, it does. 
So, you know, in summary, uh, and we're going to have an ex expansive um, um, Q&A. Look, we're on time. Ross, can you believe that? We said 35 minutes and it's 34 minutes. So I, I was worried because Ross usually talks quite a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> These are both attractive assets that we've been talking about in an inflationary environment. I would stress, you know, we're making no false claims here. In a deflationary environment, both assets are pretty horrendous. If we had a 1982 um, type environment and, the, and, and they wanted to put interest rates up um, way above the rate of inflation, which is highly unlikely, then that would be terrible for both gold and Bitcoin. It seems unlikely in the near term, in the near future. Um, but the, the, the most important point is that the reason Bitcoin is doing well is because we're in an inflationary risk on period um, or rising inflation expectation risk on period. And I would expect um, that, that just as gold handed the baton to Bitcoin in October, let's not forget between the COVID crisis last March and October, people were very worried about the economy for good reason. Uh, but then they started to really see the benefits of the stimulus come through, even though there was a lockdown and, um, and, and gold passed the baton to Bitcoin. But it will go back to gold at some point. And I think over the next decade, if we have this inflationary decade, they'll keep passing it between each other um, from, from, from time to time. So, you know, the bottom line is gold's demise is greatly exaggerated. We're in a macro environment that favours Bitcoin, uh, and that's really why it's doing so well relative to gold. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's absolutely ridiculous to suggest that, 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 God, that Bitcoin is ready to take over from gold. For a start, not a single central bank owns it, possibly the exception of Iran. Uh, risk weighting between them makes sense, you know, some sort of disciplinary balancing strategy. And please do uh, contact Bankery Asset Management. I can't possibly tell you, tell you what we do because we're not allowed to, but do get in touch and look at our website and so on if you are curious. Thank you. So, Charlie, I think we go to um, the other Charlie. Uh, perhaps we can go to, to questions. Absolutely. Charlie, Ross, thank you so much. Uh, uh, terrifically interesting and a, a hugely compelling uh, case there. Uh, we do have a number of uh, questions coming firing in. Uh, so thanks very much, everyone out there. Um, one, I think, is to do with the sort of timing of inflation. And I think it touched on something a number of people certainly asked me is, is you know, we, we, we're in a sort of inflationary moment. Uh, you know, at now it's, it seems perfectly obvious, but, but how sustainable uh, is that? Is, 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 is there anything, is, is, is there a sort of uh, relief rally element to this? And, uh, you know, if bond yields tick up too high, does it create a, a, a huge problem for the, for the economy, given the amount of debt out there? Uh, and uh, as, as Harry says here, how do you think uh, the current output gap and unemployment uh, will impact the time frame uh, for inflation. So I think there are two things there. One is, are, are we seeing it, you know, as big as it will get yet? I think you sort of, you, you, you very much touched on that, Ross, um, earlier on, that, that people underestimate it. But I would also argue, is it systemic and going to last, or is there a danger uh, that, that there's some sort of deflationary crisis once we're through this sort of relief recovery post-COVID. Who too? Uh, let's start with Ross on that, please. Yeah, good. Um, I suppose we all thought we'd be out of lockdown by now and, and, and through the worst, but, you know, looking at the vaccine programme in Europe and the, the mess they're making of it, one can't really see Europe emerging from, from its um, the current position for some months to come. Interesting that, that Europe seems to be firing, uh, sorry, Asia, is firing up and uh, it's getting close to 90% of pre-COVID levels in Europe. We're still seven, 68 to 70%, still well behind. The US, somewhere in the middle. So, so the recovery, the fiscal, the, the, the recovery that we're all looking for, I think will come. Um, but I think it seems to be constantly um, deferred to some extent. Um, we, we've always said from, from the beginning, we thought this is the second half of this year um, the inflation we're talking about here, a second half of this year's story. This, you know, this, this year, this first half, it'll be more about um, debt and the crisis, ongoing issues around that. So I suspect it won't be until the second half of the year that inflation really starts to bite and we start to see it coming through in the CPI numbers. Um, that's, that's as we see it. Charlie, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I think that no one disagrees that the short term cyclical inflation is going to come through. I mean, that's what happens when you have an economic recovery. It's no big deal. It's, it's, it's normal. 
And so we've seen a very low oil price go to 70. But the big question is, does that $70 oil price go to 170? Does it stay at an average price above 100 for the next 10 years? Um, have we done something in the monetary system, for example, backstopping lending? I mean, just at the last budget, um, you know, the, the, the chancellor looks at house prices and says the young can't buy houses. And not seeing that the problem might be high house prices, they think, oh, not enough credit. So they, they, they guarantee loans. They guarantee them. So the banks go, oh, great, okay, I can lend now because no risk because government's got, got my back. And that's happening in many different sectors. And, and so some of the clever people, uh, the clever macroeconomists, which is not me, you know, I'm a pretend macroeconomist. I, I'm an asset allocator and a, and a, and a stock picker. Um, but th these guys like Russell Napier and so forth and, and uh, Chris Wood and, you know, all the proper clever people that we respect um, are saying it's a game changer. And these people have been in the, the deflation camp for a long time. They're saying it's, it's different this time. Yeah. Okay, so just take it, I'm just going to take the, the, the whole inflation thing on a little bit further. So we've got a question here from someone who's obviously studied the, the, the correlations very closely and says, you know, gold uh, correlates to inflation if inflation is greater than 3%. Uh, but for now, gold remains correlated to the US dollar uh, and Bitcoin very much to the SPAC uh, index. <laughs> So the question follows, what would make gold and Bitcoin correlation rise, if anything? Charlie, let's start um, with you. Well, I think when we talk about CPI, you know, I've, I've, I've dismissed the link between gold and CPI many years ago when I designed the model. I look at, I look at in expectations 20 years into the future, what the, what the tips price are telling you. It's a very different story to what CPI is saying. You know, CPI is, 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 a, is massively lagging compared to what the bond market is, is telling you. You know, the two, five, 10, 20 year expect, inflation expectations are already high. Yeah, CPI, we're waiting for it to happen. We, we know it's going up, it's bloody obvious, but you have to wait for the bloody data to come through. You know, duh. So, you know, you look at expectations, forward expectations, and that's where it is, and that's what the market is pricing. Um, what we, the, 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 the thing is, I was saying that, you know, the, the five years are really high, but the 30s aren't so high. So you've got this kind of negative outlook. I don't know which way around I'm on the camera, but, you know, so, so it's saying that in 30 years time, it's sort of, you know, you're higher than normal, but not massively so. But in five, but the next five is it's high, particularly the next you know two to five. Um, but but we ride through that. That's what the market's telling you. You know, if it's wrong, it's that long end that comes up because of all this, you know, stimulus and bank credit and you know, funny business and all the stuff. Now, SPAC, you know, good. I like that. It's very amusing. That's that's basically just saying that Bitcoin speculative and and is um, correlating with speculative assets. I'm sure SPAC would be one. I'm sure you know the, the arc thing and you know all that stuff. Anything to add there, Ross? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think inflation, um, about 3%. I mean, Bitcoin's never been tested in a, a serious inflationary environment. It's a, it's a relatively new asset. And rewinding back to 1973, gold was trading at $161 an ounce. And uh, by 1980, it's up at $850 an ounce, 30% year on year, as I, as I mentioned earlier. So that's as near as gold's going to get to what I described as uh, stupid percent. Um, you know, other things come into play to prevent gold from getting too hard in the same way that a keel prevents a boat tipping over. It has a writing mechanism attached to it. So does gold. It doesn't get ahead of itself. Scrap comes to the market, price sets to parts of the market decline, etc. So it doesn't get out of hand. It's the legacy issue that gold's got that, that uh, Bitcoin doesn't have to worry about. But if, we're, if I'm right in saying that we could have inflation above 3%, 4, 5, even 6, 7%, well, I think then gold will be back to those sort of numbers that we're seeing, 20-something percent gains for some period to come. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how Bitcoin responds. Charlie, Charlie's model, and I, and I go with it, suggests that Bitcoin will do the same and more. Um, so I think it'll be um, a very, very positive environment for both asset classes. Ross, can I say, you know, I, I did answer the, the last question um by, by talking about cpi and and forward expectations but you said that gold correlates to inflation or well, the credit Suisse report um above three percent was that cpi was that expectations that was cpi okay yeah, yeah. okay cool. good, good their report i mean we didn't write it so i don't know <laughs> uh thank you very much sir now of course there are governance uh issues particularly around bitcoin uh, it's 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 a threat that we're all uh, aware of, and a couple of questions uh, are touching uh, in on that. One is that, um, and in fact, this applies to both asset classes. 
which is that Ray Dalio, uh, I think, came out yesterday and said um, uh, that policymakers could very well impose prohibitions against capital movements to other assets uh, in the sort of environment that, that, that we're facing. Uh, and, you know, at the very same time, uh, we've got a lot of noise coming from, from, from India, uh, where, where, where there, there are concerns that they're, that they're going to ban uh, crypto. We're, we're not entirely sure whether it's a comprehensive, complete ban or whether they're just in a sort of advisory phase, but there's, there's, there's lots of different noises coming out. Uh, but these are obviously um, threats. Uh, gold markets known it before, back in ancient history. Where, where do you see that at the moment? Let's start with you, Ross, particularly on, on, on gold to start to start off with. Yeah. Well, How far away are we from that sort of... Going know? back to India, let's talk in India and... Um, the recent announcement about banning, potential banning of crypto trading. Um, the Indian government seems to have been at war with gold for the best part of a decade. Um, it accounts for roughly half its current account deficit. And if it can stop people buying gold uh, and buy productive assets in the country, they would rather that. And so to that extent, the government has put taxes up and up and up from two and a half to five to seven. Now currently at 12% plus a duty on top of that. Um, and not only that, they've tried to obfuscate the whole rules around 80-20 rules, etc. You, you need a PhD to understand gold into India um, because they keep constantly changing the arrangements. The reality is they try to throw a smoke or um, a fog over the market to try to wean Indians off this asset. Um, uh, and it hasn't succeeded. Um, the Indians are, it's a part of their DNA, it's a part of their culture. They get it. Um, and they've been served well by being in gold. Um, and I, I think that I can understand why the Indian government might choose to want to limit cryptocurrency trading. But at the end of the day, people, the money will go where it wants. And I think your ability to police such an activity is limited. Um, I think that governments will recognize the value of what this brings, although it is slightly anarchic, the idea of cryptocurrencies, um, and they may trade a rate it in to some extent. At the end of the day, the people want it. And I don't suppose they'll, they'll limit that any more than they can the Internet. Thank you. Yeah, well, and, and and yeah, in in Western countries, do you think gold is is ever going to go? Through? Was it nineteen thirty six? Is it? Are we going to have that moment again? What do you mean confiscation? Yeah, um, I don't see it ever happening in London, uh, in the UK. The global market. For the simple reason is London controls the. Um, it's the global capital for trading gold. The professional market does sixty billion plus sixty billion a day. Uh, and if they confiscate gold, um, they won't capture much. The, the, the retail market here in London is tiny. It's about 12, 14 tons of gold. That's about 0.3% of physical demand at a retail level. So confiscating mums and pops from any gold is not going to net very much. And by extension, they could damage the professional market. And by extension, the Bank of England's ability to um, take in deposits from around the world will be, de will, will be seriously limited. I don't envisage any time that the that the government could be so stupid as to want to kill um, um, a market which which accounts for a significant part of the UK's GDP um, and it's profitable. I'm talking about the professional market. Charlie, how do you think about it in Bitcoin terms? I mean, I, I suspect there's a, there's a big generational issue here as well, and you know, votes are at stake, right? Yeah, well, I I think when it, when it comes to India um, or any country. And, and when you're sort of making investment decisions about whether you would want to invest in that country, you know, the freedom of capital, freedom of freedom of capital is, um, is, is, is part of that decision making process. And so to my mind, when I read the article that they're saying no Bitcoins, please, in India, and it's illegal to own them, not just you can't trade them or you can't sell investment products, which is one thing, but you can't own them, trade them, get involved or, or, or whatever, then, you know, to me, that's a black mark um, against against the credibility of that. Um, country deserving a capital allocation, and and I think that you know it has been proven over the years that the more you try to restrict the free move from the capital, the more it wants to move. And so I think that if you you know stay free and open, um, then then hopefully people will be more relaxed and, and leave their capital there in the first place. So it, I think any country that does that, they'll see negative connotations, um, and it would lead to to a higher cost of capital generally, and investors will flee. So, you know, certainly I, I, I'm watching India and thinking, I, I don't like what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very hard to police, I suspect. Um, 
just to talk about the the the, the strategy, uh, I think this one goes particularly to Charlie uh, of the Bitcoin and gold strategy that you you, you outlined. Um, uh, we have a question: in, in what proportion of gold of gold Bitcoin is bold structured? Uh, is that a fixed ratio, or, or or is it variable? And if it's variable, uh, how does that how how does that work? Well, um, thank you for asking. Please visit the uh, Bytrade Asset Management website for a, for a more, much more detail on this. But we've explored dozens and dozens, and the team have I bore them um, senseless with different um, ways of <laughs> of, of, of um, allocating between gold and Bitcoin. And we we came down to the to the idea that somewhere between twenty and thirty percent Bitcoin, the more volatile one gets less, and 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 sort of seventy or eighty gold is about right. You can choose a fixed number. And rebalance on a regular basis that might work and um but what we're actually doing our preferred strategy is more complex and that is volatility weighting so sometimes bitcoin's calm like it was in 2015 or 16 um or indeed in 2019 it was pretty calm so at periods like that you can own more and 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 when bitcoin's noisy like 2017 18 um, um or, or, or indeed this year then you'd be starting to to drift away from it slightly and, and, and start to reduce your weight so the idea of um adjusting according to prevailing volatility is a pretty good way of doing that and 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 you know so we so so we published it. It's three hundred and sixty day volatility. Um, it's a very simple calculation. It's on the website. Please do have a look. Uh, but I would say that if you can't be bothered with our complex volatility calculation, just use a number between twenty and thirty percent and rebalance once a month. And I think that will do you proud. Yeah, yeah. As Charlie said, please do get in touch with us if you if you want to know more about what we're up to uh, from a product perspective uh, at Bytrain Asset Management. Um, Another question just on Bitcoin in particular and its relationship with bond yields. Do you expect Bitcoin to detach from its positive correlation with bond yields, given that they, I assume bond yields, can't rise much further in the current economic scenario? So if the question means if they turn down, will Bitcoin turn down? Um, well, I think if, if they turn down, then it go, you know, Bitcoin hands the baton to God. Um, but if they carry on going up, can Bitcoin... Um, Keep on, keep on benefiting from a rising bond yield. Well, well, I think also if if they can't go up any more, but stay where they are now, so can, Bitcoin, curve control. Can, can Bitcoin still rise? But there's, there's a lot of questions in there. So there's a yield curve control. You know, would that help Bitcoin or not? Let, let's let's park that for the second. So let's say bond yields went to ten percent. You know, sometimes if you don't know the answer of what the small move would mean. Think about a massive move and. What would that do? And that it becomes much easier to visualize. I think if the bond yield went to 10%, we woke up tomorrow morning, um, would that be good? Well, if inflation also went somewhere near 10%, then I think Bitcoin would be very, very happy with that. And many, many other assets would be pretty unhappy about that. So I think it's that relationship between, you know, is that an inflationary 10%? Or, or not. So yeah. if inflation is, is stays where it is and the bond yield goes to 10%, then then I think Bitcoin will go, well, that's horrible. You know, that, in that scenario, 8% real interest rates, we'd all run to the bank and put our money in. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, can you imagine, you know, there'd be a, a run at the bank to get your money in if you get 8% real. But um, we haven't seen that for a while, have we? Uh, no, not for a very long time. Um, a question here for Ross. Uh, Ross, do you see uh, Basel III influencing the gold market in the second half of the year? You might have to, I, I, I'm not familiar what the, 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 that question means, yeah. so if you can explain. Um, I, I don't really feel qualified to answer that question, really. I mean, Basel III is all about capital adequacy ratios, etc. And, and it's, a, it's about how much banks have to put aside against their, their, their positions. Um, I, 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 I'm not really an expert in that particular field, so I, I'm not going to go into it except to say that the likelihood is that banks will have to put more capital aside against their positions and by extension, um, loans and such items will become more expensive. Um, and there is a negotiation going on how much they should put aside, what sort of haircut you can put against physical gold. And the gold market's trying to express to the regulators as best they can that gold is a large and liquid asset. Uh, they don't see it that way. And so gold is penalized. And by extension, um, you know, you have to have an awful lot of gold behind you and therefore loans are expensive the effect of it could on the face of it mean that jewelry shops bullion businesses and the like that want to 
finance their windows or their working capital will have to pay an awful lot more. And by extension, people looking to buy gold will have to pay an awful lot more, a higher premium for their metal because of the because of this loading of the cost that comes through. What the actual levels will be, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert in Basel III, uh, but I do understand negotiations are still ongoing about what sort of haircut you should have against your gold positions. Brilliant. Yeah, I think I, I've got a really good answer here. Only if I'm allowed to phone a friend. Because I do, I, you know, one, one of the great things about this business is, is you, you, you spend enough time in it, you get to know someone everywhere who knows everything about something or other. And it's never the same person who can answer all the questions. But, you know, yes, yes, I do know people who could, who could, who could very, very uh, brilliantly answer that question. I think I you're answer, answer, answer that question. And I suspect he's the guy who asked the question in the first place. Because he <laughs> you joined me on, <laughs> I don't know, exactly. you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> that would be yes that'd be classic um i have a question i, I very obviously you know we're, we're moving into a phase that we sort of haven't even thought about for the last sort of 30 years pretty much a sort of long-term inflationary era I, I and i don't know the answer to this but i wonder if either you two what sort of exposure do institutions have to to gold uh, at this moment and I, i'd particularly like to know from ross and if he if, if he has interactions with institutional managers of money what what their sort of thought process is about uh holding gold at this point well go back again rewind to the 1970s and um uh gold was six percent of global assets under management uh and today it's just a little less than half um in short uh, yes exactly um it's it's just, in short it's a small number um, it, people seem to have a, a fairly binary attitude towards it. They either love it or they don't. Institutions such as Rafa that you'll know and others um, will typically put 5 or 10% of their assets into, into gold. Um, many others um, think it's archaic and a barbaric asset. I mean, they, would, they wouldn't consider it. I think it's a shame because gold has demonstrated over millennia uh, an ability to, to, to maintain its purchasing power. Truth is, it's, it's, it performs better in the very long run. Um, and it's an ideal asset, really, for your pension. Um, you know, over the last, since 1971, it's averaged about 10% a year compounded. So what's not to like? Um, you just have to take out the peaks and the troughs. It does what it should do in the long run. And I think it's an asset for the long run. It's an investment. As a, as a medium of speculation, I think it's, it's, if you forgive the pun, mercurial. It's difficult to grasp. You know, people describe it as a sum of all fears. And it tends to migrate from obsessing on one particular line of data to another and to another. So, so it's quite hard to always keep a grasp on what's driving gold. That's why journalists love it. It's not like copper, which has got a supply and demand dynamic. You know, mm. it's, it's like a labrador. It's a bit dull. You know, gold's always changing. Uh, and that's what keeps people interested in it. Um, and so in short, you know, um, asset managers, I, I think a good number, particularly in the UK, some get it, a good number don't. Um, but I know that there are people who are evangelizing about gold. Let's not call them gold bugs. The World Gold Council, for example, has spent a good degree of time talking to UK wealth managers. Um, a big part of the story is education, um, to look at a, 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 diverse, a diversified portfolio and how you can enhance it by having allocation to gold. And I think that works ongoing, and, but it's tough here. You know, gold's not, even, even though London owns the gold market, if I can put it in those terms, you know, it, it continues to be a small domestic market. It's not in our DNA, particularly as Brits. The Germans, on the other hand, get it. Uh, look at the German central bank. Uh, no, it's got 10 times the UK's uh, central bank gold holdings. Look at the average German. He's got four times the propensity to save. Look at the German market. It's 10 times the UK market at a retail level. So, you know, you can see that the Germans get it in the way that you, the, us Brits don't quite, even though we've got the home ground advantage. I mean, and, and, and do you see attitudes changing? At all, I mean, oh, is there a, a sort of growing acknowledgement that now is the time, or you know, this is a generation of fund managers who've never had to bother, to be honest. Well, um, in the business I previously ran at uh, Sharks Pixies across the road from Whites, uh, and at Whites, you know, the, the, the good sort, let's call them deeply wealthy, not bling. Um, and you know, they'd come across after a good lunch and they'd say, So, what the hell do you do? They normally throw uh, an expletive in the middle of that. Uh, and I say, if I said I'd sell, sell gold, they would yawn and we'd talk a bit. But if you say we're into wealth management, they'd get it, because that's why they're there. For that moment in time when the family wealth could be eroded overnight by an inflationary moment, precisely the kind of environment that we might be facing in the next five or ten years. So Brits of a sort get it. You know, those who, who are 
who look at wealth management, it's on their radar. Moms and pops get it to an extent, and I think they know, they're not silly. They will be buying ounces and so on. They're confused and they're worried, uh, and they acquired. Cumulatively, it's, it's still pretty small beer. Institutional investors, yeah, a bit. They come and go. When we saw the massive flow of ETF buying last year, the 341 tons in the first quarter, actually most of that was European institutional investors. Um, they saw that things weren't quite right. They, came, they took their foot off the pedal in the second quarter. It was then American institutions who were buying. It was a moment in time. Um, but broadly speaking, gold remains a, I mean, um, a European phenomenon more than a British phenomena. Many, most of our clients I would have described in the wealthy sector to have been Europeans rather than Brits, if I can put it that way. Yeah, no, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, half a percent. I mean, you sort of sort of start thinking, well, why, why, why bother with Bitcoin if, if, if gold is only half a percent? And actually that leads on to another question that's just come in, which, which is a good one, which is, you know, we're, we're, we're obviously a, a, a digital asset facing asset management company. Uh, it's understandable we're positive about Bitcoin, but what's the counter argument that you'd find most compelling? One for you, Charlie. Um, I think the, the, the big one is that it's all rather lovely how we mine fewer and fewer Bitcoins um, over the next um, three years, um, then you know, the next four years and after that and so on. But then um, the, the, there's, two, there's two answers to this. The, uh, the second one's the ESG, which I'll get to. But the, the first one is this idea that the miners mine fewer and fewer Bitcoins. So they're, they're going to mine um, a million over the next three months sorry three years and, and and if the price is fifty thousand, that means 50 billion dollars of inflow needs to come into the network to sustain the current price and if the price is a hundred thousand dollars times a million then that's a hundred billion dollars so that's a lot of money and 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 so you know but, but if there's inflation and all the rest of it and people are scared and they're looking for diversification it's really nothing in the global financial system so if it's a deserved hundred billion or a trillion or whatever it needs to be then that can happen if if, if circumstances demand it um, but as you go down the line, I sort of wonder if, you know, once we sort of run out of Bitcoins to mine in 10, 20 years, yes, it becomes a lot cheaper to sustain a high price in the network. But then would the miners get bored and stop securing it so much? Would the fees get too high? And so that balance of mining in 10, 20 years time uh, versus fees will become um Will, 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 will become ever more important because, you know, at the moment, I think fees account for about 12 percent of uh, Bitcoin miner reward and that just goes up and up and up every every cycle and so I don't know where that takes us in the future and there's a lot of debate about it and the mechanism of the blockchain yeah the blockchain will always survive um, but will it be an efficient system in the future that that's one and the second related to that of course is the ESG implications of mining Bitcoin um, you know it could be that the that it's not the Ray Dalio view that, that, that clamps down on Bitcoin, but the ESG view. And then the response, of course, is that um, the, the, the network wants to use renewables. And, and I hope that's the case. But, but those are the two clouds, I think, over a pretty exciting space in many, many other ways. And I, I, I'd add to that on ESG, for, certainly for gold. Um, I, I view ESG, perhaps, if you like, a bit like um, political correctness and climate change, two very good ideas that became um, politicized and weaponized. And if, it, if that happens in the gold space, I think you could find NGOs and the like seeking to close the sector down. They're not very keen on extractive industries. Um, if it's to tighten up the industry to make sure that best practices are achieved, I would applaud it. If it's, um, but if it's taken to an extreme, it could be damaging for, for the whole extractive sector. The second um, issue that I worry about for gold, if you like, the counter argument, is, the, is that it might fail to evolve in a digital world. I mean... Gold is deeply siloed. Um, clients typically like to hold their customers hostage. In other words, you buy from me, you sell through me, you store with me, I, I charge you rent. Gold doesn't have the network effect that Bitcoin has. It doesn't have the transferability, doesn't have the fungibility. Um, it doesn't have the usability of money. You, you know, it's not a medium of exchange. My fear for gold is it remains something um, um, of a niche asset you know, that's not evolving with the digital world. It needs to be digitized and transferable. It needs to mimic now what Bitcoin has done. And both of them need to move forward into a world where they are more usable. They both need to become money. And for that, Bitcoin needs to be spendable to buy a coffee. You need to be able to trade it in such a way that you can buy a coffee. In other words, settlement needs to come down to seconds. And equity gold. And then you can say, 
you know, gold has achieved its real aim to be money. It's a store of value, I get that. It's not a medium of exchange. And I suspect Bitcoin would become a medium of exchange. And when it does, its moment will really have arrived. Uh, but it needs to move forward. Both of them need to move forward from where they are. Thank you. I mean, just from your perspective as, a, as coming very much from the gold side, I mean, how, how do you think about allocating between the two assets, Ross, at, at, at this point? Is it, you, you know, we, we've given us yeah. a volatility, historic volatility driven one, but, but there's more, I think, to, to think about than that. From a, on a personal front, I mean, I, I don't have any Bitcoin or exposure to it. I wish I did. I'm a fan of the sector. I'm a, I, I love and admire the technology. Um, it's a bit like your children, you know, they copy your music and rewrite it and uh, claim it as theirs. Well, they've done it with Gold World too. They've done it through Bitcoin and I admire it, but it now needs to take it forward and become more mature. As I say, and I describe it being usable. Uh, you, need, you need to add utility to these cryptocurrencies. At the moment, they're, to me, more an object of speculation. I love the underlying technology, but when they can move forward to become real money, then they really are interesting. And they haven't quite got to that level. Um, where you can, as I say, settle a trade for a coffee. That's my benchmark and say that you can do it. You'll probably tell me you can, um, but I think it's quite difficult. Certainly Bitcoin, I think the settlement period is rather too long. Your coffee is cold before your trade is settled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a couple more questions. One here, particularly for you, Ross. Uh, you've mentioned in the past that gold cycles can last for around eight years. Uh, so would the current cycle have started in 2016? when gold bottomed, or in 2019, when it broke out of its 1,200 range? Yeah, I thought, I'd have gone with 12, 2018. I mean, 12, 2019 is when um, we had negative real rates, and that was really the kicker. But on the charts, I think I would take 2018 as the bottom in the gold price on the charts. We're currently in a down, we're in, up, we're in an uptrend with a, down, with a down channel leg at the moment. Gold needs to break out of that. So we're, we're a couple of years or so into a cycle. Um, I, I, I envisage we've got another good five years ahead of us. Whether it's going to be double digit gains every year, I don't know. Um, but certainly it feels like we're at the beginning of a, of a major bull run and uh, we could see some good gains from here. OK, brilliant. And, and Charlie, for you, do you think there's any room for silver uh, in, 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 in the bold mix? No, but I do think there's room for silver in a um, sold mix, so silver and gold. Because I think that Bitcoin, from a macro perspective, has taken that top right box in the money map, and silver lives in that box too. Yeah. In the good old days, you would blend your risk on silver inflationary asset with your risk off gold inflationary asset, and fine. That's a good idea for a product for, for, for us, actually, Charlie, because we could actually talk about it legally um, without having to, to, to hide under the desk because we have Bitcoin products. Um, but, you know, silver and gold would actually rebalance beautifully for the same reasons. Obviously, silver is interesting, but not nearly as, um, as, as dynamic as Bitcoin has been. Um, you know, I'm silver bullish. I like silver very much, but it, but it, but it ain't Bitcoin, is it? I mean, it's sort of, it, it, it's, it's um, I, think, I think the guy at HSBC from the gold desk used to say, uh, who's Australian, you say, mate, silver, that's gold on crack. <laughs> and and, and you know, if, 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 if silver's gold on crack, then don't know what the hell that means. Well, Bitcoin, yeah. Well, it's sort of silver on on something, a, a lot or something. That's right. That's right. Good. Silver, silver on Tesla. Silver. <laughs> um, I think we're we 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 we're, we're largely there. We've had some fantastic uh, questions, a lot of great insights from from both of you, uh, and, and it's been a it's been a lot of fun. Uh, one last one for, for Ross. Gold or gold suppliers? Sorry, you've lost me. Gold, gold or gold producers? Sorry. Uh, um, a gold, I would think. I mean, with producers, you've got exposure to management and you, well, if you're prepared to do the legwork to understand the quality of the mine and the underlying asset, um, then good luck. I don't do mines. Um, and to some extent, they've been eclipsed by the birth of the ETF. It's interesting that, you know, when the ETF came out, the mining shares, um, fell, fell away. Inst institutions wanted exposure to gold and historically the only way you could do it was synthetically through buying the mining shares. So when the ETF came along that forged a big conduit mm. into the gold market in, in about 2003. The irony is that it was the gold miners that produced the gold ETF which killed their share price that propelled oh. the gold price. I didn't know that. Um, so, so I mean I don't do I don't follow mining shares in particular um, uh, I wouldn't make a comment there.
Okay, and Charlie, Bitcoin or the Coinbase? Uh, well, I want that last question. Um, firstly, you don't get oil price going up. It's never quite so fun for, for the miners. But you know, Ross correctly points out that the miners derated in November of 2003 when the Bitcoin, sorry, the, the gold ETF start, started to grow. And you know what would happen if we had Bitcoin ETFs in America today? So the so you know at the moment everyone's buying closed ended funds, which I'm writing about this tomorrow. Um, the, the, the grayscale and the other closed ended funds in Canada, and the reason they buy them is because they have to, because they can't buy what they actually want to buy, which is Bitcoin. Mm. And so all of these things and the the sort of crypto proxies, so that the, the exposure by the stock market would probably trade at a slight premium um, because investors want exposure. And so I guess the the you know the, the, the gold miners discount versus gold would would happen in in this space um, if if real Bitcoin ETS came along in the, in North America. Of course, we have to be in Europe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Charlie Ross, thank you so much. Thank you to all the people who stayed with us and have, uh, have listened in. It's been, it's been great fun. Uh, and uh, you know, anyone, do, do drop us a line at uh, Bytree Asset Management uh, if you'd like any more info on, the, on, on our products uh, or, or on the data that we provide. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>